I, I do want to backtrack here a couple steps, Jerry. So you brought up a good point, Cole Custer getting the penalty and and what happened with his teammate there on the last lap on the back stretch. So in your opinion, I, I believe you were on the conference call with NASCAR earlier this week when they were discussing the penalty. Yes. What made this penalty any different or potential penalty different from, well, let's say what happened at Bristol last year where Chase Elliott slowed up Kevin Harvick at Bristol and let his teammate go on to win. What makes this one different from that or any other big, prior to The biggest difference was that Chase Elliott did what he did on his own. He didn't have a crew chief coming into his ear telling him to pull over on the backstretch. Um, and they looked at all the data. They looked at all the uh, the radio chatter, everything. All of that was going on. With, the only place they found problems was when the crew chief told Cole to back it down because he, quote, had a flat when he didn't. But that let, you know, uh, Briscoe by so that he can, you know, and he can move on to the in the playoffs. Uh, it's different because, and they looked at Chase last year, but because no one told Chase, that was an on track thing where there was some gray area. That's why it's different, and there wasn't a lot of gray area on this. And also, they listened to Briscoe's audio, and not any time during the race on Briscoe's audio. Did they ever ask for where people were at? What do I need? All he wanted to know was where he was at and the points where he needed to move. He, he never asked for any collusion, never, you know, no chicanery, nothing like that. It was straight racing talk that I mean, David can, can address this because he's a driver. And, you know, it's you have certain things that are said every week over the radio. Nothing deviated from it. Hey, I, I want to uh, jump in here real quick, and I have to be honest with you. Um, I didn't get to watch the race Sunday. I was at my shop uh, working on uh, on our racing school cars, and I, and I heard the last, I heard the ending, probably the last four or five laps. And I'm not, I'm, I want to backtrack a little bit. Uh, and and can y'all tell me again what happened? So basically, Cole Custer was racing ahead of the three car and the 14 car and the 14 needed to get by Custer and the three in order to advance in the playoffs. Right. Um, and Cole's coming down the back stretch and his crew chief comes over the radio and says, Hey, you got a flat. I think you got a flat. I think you got a flat backer down. So he does, but the crew chief wasn't, Crew chief wasn't seeing the car. He was just telling him to slow down because they knew where they knew the proximity of where Briscoe was at and what points he needed to advance into the playoffs. Now, as it stands, he technically, according to NASCAR, that didn't make a difference. Um, I guess because he got around another car on his own, but I mean he knocked Larson out by two points. Wow. So, and they considered. They considered looking at Briscoe and suspending him, uh, but he did. Like I said on the radio, he didn't do anything wrong. They also considered looking at Cole Custer and suspending him, but that goes against the precedent that they've kind of set in the past. Of the only reason why they park a driver is for a safety issue and you know things like that. This was uh, this was, it, it. It has to be very egregious for them to park a driver. Is what is what uh, Scott Miller said. So, Jerry, the way I'm understanding it, uh, so Cole Custer got orders from his crew chief that basically slow down, let his teammate go by, or basically yeah. and said, hey, will, you got a flat tire, slow down. Yeah, I will, uh, I will read you the quote. Think you've got a flat. Check up, check up, check up. That was the word that came from the 41's crew chief to Cole Custer on the backstretch as he slowed to allow the 14 of Chase Briscoe to go around. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, you know, we all understand it. Um, when we have a flat, we don't need anybody to tell us. <laughs> we got a flat. <laughs> we, we're pretty much the first ones to know we got a flat, and we're usually telling our crew chief and our team, hey, we got a flat. Be ready. I'm coming to you. You know, we right. need to be quick. We don't lose a lap, you know. So, uh, yeah, you know, they kind of got caught, you know. Uh, you know, I guess, 
you, it's understandable, you know, as an organization and a team, they were trying to help their organization, their teammate be a team player. But yeah, that's a, yeah, uh, that's pretty blatant, you know what I mean? For us in the industry, you know, for somebody just listening to that, you're like, well, that's pretty cool, you know, but, but y'all know, I know, and most of us know that uh, our crew chief doesn't need to tell us that we got a flat. <laughs> We're no. to tell no. them. <laughs> so tell me this question for whether Jerry or David, either mm -hmm. one, whatever, whatever, whoever you guys want to answer this question. For the casual observer, the casual fan out there that <laughs> watches and sees plate racing of, you know, the orders come from the manufacturers and the teams. You guys got to help each other. You guys got to work together, you know, and, and that's the order, right? What's the difference between that and then, in this case, move out of the way to help your teammate advance in the playoffs? What's the difference between the two? What would you tell the, the casual fan that may not understand? Well, I think it's because you're still racing for a win. You're still out there trying to do your best. This is, this is an obvious example of him not doing his best, not giving the 100% rule. I mean, they told him to back down specifically because it helped his teammate. That's, that's F1 team orders all the way. In my book, that's, that's like something you'd see in an F1 race. Yeah, and, and, and you know when you're talking about Daytona and Talladega, the manufacturers, we all know this. So we're I, I've been involved with it. They, uh, you know the, you know the GM wants to help GM, Toyota wants to help Toyota, and Ford wants to help. You know, you know when you all pit, you're all getting gas mileage. Y'all want to pit together. Y'all want to, you know, you all want to help each other from a manufacturer standpoint and we you've seen it year after year after year and sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't work out as well as the manufacturers and the and the teams want it to but uh but you know everybody's racing to get to the end and you know like the last 10 laps last five laps the last two laps you know it's every man for every team for their self you know what i mean but you know the the manufacturers want all their teams all their cars to to help each other and may the best team car driver win at the end, you know? And so that type of uh, strategy that the manufacturers really plays into the Daytona and Talladega thing is, you know, what nobody's, nobody's pulling over and letting somebody go by and stuff like that, you know, and uh, because everybody's, everybody's trying to win. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit different situation, I would say. And that's what Scott Miller said. He said it was blatantly pulling over to change the outcome of the race. Yeah, I mean. So uh, with that, you know, Kyle Larson uh, comes up short, and he had a bad day himself, finished 35th, um, and, you know, was just on the verge. It, it seemed like going into the day, he was – it was a very good chance he was going to advance, and he finds himself – uh, missing it, won't get to defend his title. Chase Briscoe advances now. Jerry, wh where do things go from here? I mean, if you're that 14 team and you, you advanced here, do you think that this team, um, you know, is, is got a target on their backs now or anything? Is this carry over to the next round? How, how does this, where's this team go from here? I don't think he makes it out of the round of eight, but I think the biggest problem here, though, is, Larson's problem was Larson. And I, I, I'm a big Kyle Larson fan. I predicted him to win 10 races last year. He won 10 races in the championship, and I made the bet on that uh, back in fe on February 14th of last year. I bet that he'd be the champion. So, uh, and, you know, he just didn't perform this year, whether it's the new car, whether it's circumstances. Uh, we had so many winners. It Kyle Larson's problem was he didn't, he didn't live up to the expectations that that he set for himself and that he, he needed to, uh, to advance. It's not two points. It's two points of, after that race, but look at all the, the, the times he had opportunities to finish better or to win races and he didn't. So that's a scenario that, you know, for that, as far as Cedric, I think he does have, I'm not Cedric, I'm Briscoe. I think he does have a, uh, uh, a target on his back to some degree. Um, do, do you retaliate against him? that could get you parked because he's a playoff driver and you don't want to affect the outcome of the race. But it, it definitely, uh, I'll tell you who might have a bigger target is Cole Custer, uh, you know, because he's the driver that um, his crew chief's the one that told him to slow down. So but that's just, that's my theory.